morning, good evening and good night to everyone across the globe. Uh, I'm Leon Smith and I'm joined by my colleagues Nellie Kaplan and Viren Joseph. Uh, we're coming to you today from the Microsoft Technology Centre in Sydney. Uh, and we also have some subject matter experts on the call from uh, different locations across the globe. We have Rich Ross and Paul Robinson. Today we have three topics we wanted to cover. Uh, we have this concept of how to as an organisation measure their corporate sustainability progress using our Microsoft Sustainability Manager. We've got a couple of little asterisks in there because we wanted to also show what we call AI for Earth and some real world conversation, conservation outcomes. And we'll finish with an overview of the planetary computer. Before I begin though, I'll just hand over to Melly uh, for an acknowledgement of country. Hello, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose lands we stand. I'd like to pay my respects to all elders, past and present, and I would ask that we support all emerging elders of all First Nation peoples all over the world. Thank you, Melly. And uh, as I mentioned, if you don't know what a technology centre is, shameless plug, uh, we're 43 locations across Microsoft in 28 countries, and we help our, our companies solve their biggest challenges using our Microsoft technologies. So the first topic, uh, sustainability and, and particularly carbon accounting. So I'll do that topic and I'll spend about 20 minutes now, with these sessions, I thought here's the key takeaways right up front. What we're going to talk to today is this topic of managing and uh, recording your carbon emissions. So what we often refer to as greenhouse gases. And Microsoft has a product in market available today to record, report and ultimately reduce those emissions. And we do that across this concept called scopes and I'll go through what a scope is. Microsoft also has a product in market today known as the Emissions Impact Dashboard. And what it does is Microsoft as a provider to organisations gives you the estimation for using your Microsoft Cloud services. We also have this bigger topic known as Microsoft Cloud for Sustainability. And what that is, is a growing set of environment, social and governance, often referred to as ESG, capabilities from both Microsoft and our partners. So if you look at that, Microsoft Sustainability Manager and Emissions Impact Dashboard are solutions of the Microsoft Cloud for Sustainability. There's only one link to remember, that's on the left, aka.ms slash cloud for sustainability. And I do have a little fine print that I won't read through in the uh, chat there. But why are we even here? Let's start there. So the scientific consensus is clear. The world has this huge carbon problem. And by that we mean that nature can't reabsorb the carbon that humans are putting into the atmosphere every year, which is over 50 billion tonnes of greenhouse gases. So that carbon blanket sits there in the atmosphere and it heats up the atmosphere. And that's what people refer to as the climate change. So right now in Australia, we're having record floods. We've had three 100 year floods in a year in Sydney, Australia. We've got record fires in the Mediterranean in Europe, and we've got record droughts in the US. So these, these events are happening all over in different ways. So this, this carbon though, it enters the atmosphere and it takes thousands of years to dissipate. So this industrial revolution that the world's been going through has been building up uh, this carbon, which then heats up the planet. And you may have heard terms like one degree Celsius or one and a half degrees Celsius, and you may have heard terms like the Paris Agreement. That's where the world and the organisations have come together to agree to some principles about how to stop this. So that's what we're doing right now, and that's why it's an imperative across many organisations and many countries, is we need to cap this, this carbon uh, warming effect so that we can sustain a, 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 a continual planet. So that's therefore led lots of organisations to this imperative of trying to reach net zero by 2050 or before. What's driving that? We're driving that. Uh, customers, partners, investors, the regulators are driving that. Even employees of companies are now choosing who they work with based on their credentials. So it's a really hot topic, uh, maybe new for some people in the IT side, 
But if you start thinking about it, it's actually a data problem, and that's what we'll get to today. Uh, and it's a data problem built by any other data problems. You could think back to financial accounting. Uh, what standards do we follow? How do we share information? How do we all speak one language? It's all manual processes today. Excel is the second best tool at everything, but it's not an ESG platform. Data sits in these silos all over the place in operational systems. And it goes, what we will go through today is the value chain. Is it goes up and down your value chain. So if that's new to you, I'll go through that. But let's get let's sort of uh, get into it a little bit more and I'll just explain what those scopes were. I only have a few slides because this is demo bite, so we will jump into demos in a moment. But I'll just explain an example of each of these scopes. So scope one, if you think of that for a person, that's effectively the, the diesel or petrol you consume in your vehicle to move your vehicle. So that's a scope one, that's direct. For a business, that might be the diesel they use in their generators or the diesel they use in their trucks moving their goods around. Scope two comes from the production of the electricity. So at home, that's your electricity for your house and the bill that comes from your electricity provider. For a business though, that's what runs their factories and plants. So it may also be the gases that they're consuming, uh, sorry, to um, the energy used to heat their uh, facilities as well. And then there's this big scope three. So that's the supply chain. That's who your organization is dealing with. And you're able to influence that supply chain. And, and then that becomes your value chain. And those decisions you make is really the way that the planet is going to reduce their emissions. And why? Because 90% of the carbon emissions sit in your value chain. But what does that really look like for a company? Let's take Microsoft, a big organization, many parts of the world. This is our value chain. So we've been carbon neutral since 2012, and predominantly that was in that scope one and two we talked about. But you can see there, we've got this big wheel on the right called 97.9% scope three. That's what we can influence as, a, as an organization in our value chain. Breaking that down though, now you start seeing the data side. So sitting behind this is a, is a platform. And I've highlighted three there, and then we'll jump into the demonstration. So as we start understanding carbon accounting, the results also may not always be what we expect. So category two is this, is this one called capital goods. Think of that as buildings, real estate, construction. And for Microsoft, that translates to building data centers. So you'll notice FY20 to FY21, we added over a million tons of carbon. So organizations on one hand are trying to reduce, but equally their business and their operations may be actually increasing. So this is where they need data-driven uh, intelligence to understand their business to make informed decisions. You'll also see category 11 there, use of sold products. You, you need to understand and count your products that you sell. In our case, that's Xbox uh, or Surface. So if you think about FY20 to FY21 and COVID, many, many people went home and started playing games. Many people went and bought new PCs. That translates to an organization like Microsoft over a million tons of extra carbon. So that's what we're looking at. It's a huge problem. Every organization is facing it. And how we as Microsoft, as a technology company, help it. So I'm going to just uh, pause for a moment, flick screens, and we'll jump straight into a demo. Okay, I'll start with what if we were sitting on a whiteboard as, as architects, I would draw out a, a bit of a component architecture like this. And so we have data sitting in operations, business units, it could be in any of those on the left. Now, often an organization will consolidate some of those operational data sets and have these data sources. It could be an ERP, it could be a cloud provider, us or someone else. It could also be as simple as an Excel file. They may be getting a, a bill once a month and that's what they use. So how do you bring all that data in, create a data pipeline and then store it? So the first bit right in the middle there is you'll see the sustainability data model. 
So part of what we're building here is a data model to do carbon accounting. What we're doing that's different though, is we're also making that data model open source and available to anyone. So our platform is built on it, but others can take that data model and extend it or build their own applications. Because this problem is bigger than just Microsoft. We need everyone to come together and be able to share data in a common way. Because remember, we were doing that upstream and downstream supply chain. Today, I'll just talk about carbon, but everything I'm talking about in principle will apply to water accounting and waste accounting, which are another two areas that are huge problems. And then our ecosystem of partners are then able to take that, what is now a source system for carbon accounting and provide the regulatory reporting or industry reporting needs that organisations need on our right and also build complete applications. For those that are uh, from our power platform side, what you'll see will be very familiar. We're building this completely on our power platform. So we have power apps at the front end. We're automating with Power Automate. Uh, we've got embedded Power BI, and we're also storing our data on Dataverse. And then we're using for some of our modeling and scorecards, we're using our data lake as well. So this is what it looks like. So I'm going to put my other hat on now, and I'll say I'm Chief Sustainability Officer for an organization. This is what they want to see. They want to be able to go to a reporting year, understand the complete emissions of their organization, understand other factors that's relevant to them. So in the industry, there's this term of revenue intensity. And think of that as a, a formula where you relate your uh, carbon equivalent uh, outputs of greenhouse gas with your revenue. And those examples I mentioned earlier is what might be very good for revenue could actually be dramatically increasing your carbon footprint. So you need to understand the relationship between those two. And that helps businesses make an informed decision uh, of their sustainable development and their revenue. We can also track renewable energy. And over on the right here, we can drill down to the organisational structure that's relevant to the company. So we can go into their organisational units, uh, we can drill into their sites. Now, being that we are running these live demos and we're doing it in the middle of Ignite, my dashboards are a little bit slower. And you can see at the top there that I'm being throttled. So I think Satcher and the other team are taking some of my capacity, uh, but we'll do our best. Normally, uh, you wouldn't get that yellow banner. So this is a complete SaaS platform. Uh, so we manage and maintain the platform. You manage and own all the data inside it, and it's completely extensible with the Power Platform as well. So this interface, uh, you could create your own. This is just what we're providing out of the box. But since that's taking a little bit of time, I'll just sort of go, I'll come back to it. So let's go to the back end. How do we get to the point that we've got this one dashboard view of all these scopes and all this information? And we do that by setting up our back end first. So we go to profiles. I mentioned the concept of organisational units. This is a very common process inside ERPs, is how do you break up your groups, divisions, departments, areas, teams? And the reason we do this is organisations need to understand their individual carbon accounting at this level uh, and make people and owners responsible for, say, APAC region, but they still need to roll it up to the corporation. So we, we've got our fictitious company here, Contosa, but equally I've started building out our corporation around Microsoft technology centres. This would be the first way you would connect into other data sets as well, like an ERP. And in the facility side, you would then associate the physical locations to that organisational structure. So uh, this allows us to then have physical location, also lat latitude and longitude for the spatial querying of these assets later on using Power BI or other tools. So here's us today uh, at MTC Sydney. So we set up the back end. Uh, in our structure. And then we also have what data are we tracking? And this is where the common data model really starts to bring itself in. Uh, interest of time, I won't go through it all, but it's a really complex area. Like what are the greenhouse gases? What are the categories or factors against each of these greenhouse gases? 
Where do you reference that and maintain that? That's part of the common data model that's underpinning it. And as you would expect, the platform is able to be regionalised with any sort of uh, units of measure and also internationalised for language. So out of the box, it, it supports uh, all the languages that come with the Power Platform. I'll show the Teams integration in a moment. So that we set up all our organisational structure. So this is now, uh, this would be IT helping the ESG, the Environment Social Governance Team, create that back-end structure of how they want to manage their reporting. So a good example is if you had a fleet of 500 trucks, you would associate that with a facility. You wouldn't necessarily try and track each of the individual 500 trucks. So once we've got our structure set up at the back, we then need to get some data into it. And this is where a data analyst, uh, so now IT is involved, and we're working with uh, the custodians of the data. So this would be a very traditional data custodian uh, view. Uh, big organisations I've worked with can have five, 600 data sources uh, for carbon accounting. That's why technology companies like us can help add quite a lot of value at a platform level. And you'll see terms here, some of them make sense. Purchase electricity, so I mentioned scope two earlier would be where you buy electricity. This value chain, this is where uh, I've mentioned capital goods, but equally business travel. Organisations want to track their business travel. Some of you may be travelling for this conference. How do you estimate the greenhouse gases and emissions associated with that travel to this event? So I'll show you a little quick example. Let's have a look at, uh, at, at what this means. So we have this concept of data connections. So this is a way of creating a data pipeline uh, having logic as we bring that data in and being able to automate that data as well. So, and this can be as simple as Excel. So today we'll just have a quick look at an example of how we would bring in uh, business travel. And we might have our uh, marketing team for this event create a little bit of a spreadsheet, as simple as at that level. So we can go all the way to something as simple as a spreadsheet, all the way through to connecting to enterprise data platforms. Uh, I might have to ping Satya again and get back some capacity. This doesn't work, I won't go through the whole click through. But those on the call, if you're familiar with our Power Query component within the Power Platform, that's what we're offering here is, so we have all the uh, standard connectors to IT systems, but what we're doing with as Microsoft is we're working with industry systems to be able to surface those up. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. This is a little bit slow for me, so I'll uh, come back to it in a moment. I'll let that one just run. So, uh, so we would go through this process of creating the connector uh, and then we'd set some rules around that. So that's where our automation comes into it. Uh, and then we would have a persistent connector available. And I mentioned, um, you can see here, we've got also our competitive data sources. So if data is already being managed by our customers in Google BigQuery, there is a connector for Google BigQuery. We don't expect, uh, if you go back to our reference architecture, we don't expect to replace these data source systems. All we're interested in is the carbon accounting data. So we can connect to just about anything. And if it's not out of the box with Power Query, you can create your own connectors. And equally, you could connect to, say, Synapse Analytics as the data source where you're already aggregating and enriching the data. So we would do this connector. Uh, and this also could bring in pre-calculated emissions. So the difference here is think of activity data as I use so many kilowatt hours of electricity and I want to convert it, whereas pre-calculated emissions is I've generated 800 kilograms of greenhouse gases and I want to uh, record it. And reference data is I want to bring in my ERP organisational unit structure. So you'll end up with hundreds of these connectors uh, in a real production environment. We also have this concept of data providers. I touched on this earlier about working with our partners. Our first partner is actually ourselves. So 
this is where we have our emissions impact dashboard for Azure. And for those that may not have seen it, we have two versions. Uh, I'll just show the one for Azure. It comes up for me. We can show the one for emissions impact for Microsoft 365. So what this is doing is giving you as an organization the greenhouse gas equivalents of running services in the Microsoft cloud. In carbon accounting speak to organizations, this is a scope three category one where they've bought a good or service from someone else. And we provide that information so therefore our customers can make informed decisions. And we do that uh, across the Microsoft 365 service as well as Azure. And then we surface that up as a data provider. And I'll try and spend a couple more minutes and then we'll keep moving forward so everyone, our other topics can uh, be discussed. We have this idea of calculations though. So this is where we start modeling the data and we're able to then generate uh, the greenhouse gas equivalents. So I mentioned business travel earlier. If you wanted to measure your travel for a conference like you're at now, how do you manage all of that? So the good thing is we have this concept of factor libraries. So the US EPA has factor libraries. You can also create your own though. So this is where we take a factor library that's referenced and referenceable. So when you have external auditing and assurance in two years time, and you want to understand how did I convert my hotel stay into electricity, you're able to reference this document, this factor, and then this model is also then associated to that calculation and factor library. So if we went into business travel, you're actually able to then have uh, now uh, proof about how you created that estimation. So what we've done here is did you stay at a hotel and Behind this is also a lot more sophistication, but we convert the activity data of a night stay and how many nights you stay into then the greenhouse gas emissions and from both electricity and gas. If you also drove to that venue, we can calculate distance and how far you traveled and calculate the distance traveled. We then execute that model using what we call profiles. And that profile is often business unit dependent, or it might be uh, time dependent. So you do a, a financial year report. So I'll skip over that one just with the interest of time to see whether my report came back. Looks like it hasn't. So the only other one I just wanted to cover is the third component, which is, that's great. So if I go back to my sort of a whiteboard view. So, So we've covered very quickly. Now, often these take hours, these demos, so we're trying to do our best. We've covered this concept of connectors. We've covered the concept of a common data model. We've briefly looked at modeling, visualizing, reporting, and getting insights. But we really need to link it back to the goal of the company, so therefore we can manage the reduction. And that's where we're building right into the platform, the scorecards and goals of the organization. So this is where now boards or uh, oversight committees would be using the platform directly rather than expecting a spreadsheet, exporting it out, looking at a static document. They can go in here and understand their carbon reduction plans per business unit in the org structure and whether we're on track or not or what the risks are. So it's the data right from source is linked through right to the other end, which is the goals. And with that, I might pause because I took an extra five minutes and I will let Melly take over and we'll have a bit of a look at what we call AI for Earth and some of the examples of conversation uh, outcomes that we're doing using our platform as well. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Melly Kaplan. Um, I'm just going to go to the right slide to kick off. Here we go. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly talk about AI for Earth. For those of you that don't know, we have um, quite, as, as, well, as you know, we have quite a big commitment to sustainability. As part of that, we have the um, AI for Good, um, the AI for Good grants. As part of that, we have AI for Earth, 
And AI for Earth basically covers four areas. One is agriculture. So how are we going to help feed the world's growing population? Water, how are we going to conserve and protect water sources? Biodiversity, how are we going to monitor and protect species from extinction? And climate change, which you've obviously heard Leon talking about. At the, what I'm going to just concentrate is on biodiversity. So we have lots and lots of different fauna and flora on the planet. Um, and some, and we've barely touched the surface in actually understanding what these animals and what these plants actually, um, how they live within our, our environments. And of course, we have the, the, the danger of them being extinct before we even get a chance to identify them. So what we're going to concentrate on today, just for a few moments, is sea dragons. I've learned a lot about sea dragons over the course of this, um, over the course of the last few weeks. And I have to say that I'm very, very um, excited about them. So for those of you that don't know, sea dragons are related to seahorses. They're elegant members of what we call the Cygnathidae family, and that uh, includes seahorses, pipe fishes, etc. And what we're going to be doing is concentrating on wild sea dragons that are found along the southern coast of Australia. So AI for Good, we gave two grants for AI for Earth. And out of that came two different conservation projects, which I'm going to touch on quickly, and then I'm going to show you. So the first one is iNaturalist. You can go to iNaturalist. Um, it's a uh, citizenship science. It's a citizen science citizen scientist site, so that people from around the globe can actually identify fauna and flora. And the way that it works is it's pretty straightforward. One, um, when you see some sort of wildlife species, animals, or plants, or fungi, for those of you that don't know, don't know fungi are mushrooms, um, then what you do is you take a photo with your smartphone as a citizen scientist to capture a photo. Then that photo is uploaded into Azure, and um, observation data is sent to Azure as along with the photo. So what did you see? Where were you? What were the conditions? And then those images are shared with scientists and conservation, conservationists. So it's human powered species identification. Um, then what happens is they start training and feeding an algorithm to help better identify those species as they're being uploaded. Um, and then from there, what scientists can do then is gain insight into, you know, what is the changing of the sightings, um, pest invasions, any climate driven shifts that are happening. So it allows scientists to better protect the species. So then we're going to take it up a notch. Then there was another one that came, which was called Wild Me. Now, Wild Me is a little bit different to iNaturalist, where iNaturalist is more for the, you know, the sort of general citizen scientist. Wild Me is very, very specific. So they, at the moment, work with 50, 58 different species that they identify. So the difference here is similar. There's an animal. But the difference here, though, is that what Wild Me is interested in is the unique pattern of that animal in the wild so they can actually track it. So where iNaturalist just finds the animal and it identifies the animal, Wild Me has the ability to actually track the animal every time somebody takes a photo of it. So an image is captured by a citizen or a scientist or a photographer. That image is uploaded into Azure, either by a direct user upload or automated crawlers that scrape social media for wildlife pictures. And then in Azure, those crowdsourced images um, are then passed through um, computer vision models to find the pattern of the animal to be able to see, has it been found anywhere? Like, has anyone else uploaded a picture? Has a picture been taken anywhere else to allow it to start tracking the movement of the animals themselves? Then obviously that aggregated data helps scientists to monitor the population size, animal interactions, and individual movements. So it's kind of taking it up the next step. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen very quickly. I'm going to share my screen. If I can um, find the right one, please let this be the right one. This is the right one. Excellent. Okay. So this is iNaturalist. Now the difference with iNaturalist is Anyone can use it. You don't have to register, et cetera. It's better if you do. Um, and as you can see, we have, uh, I'm not even going to count it. It's not even 8.30 in the morning and I've only had one cup of coffee, but you can see how many observations globally, 
how many species have been identified, how many identifiers, and then how many observations. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in sea dragons. And what that's going to do is it's going to come up with a category, which is pipefishes, seahorses, and sea dragons. And I want to find how many have been found in Australia. So here you see all of the different um, pipefishes, seahorses, sea dragons, etc. So it's a bit more generic and a bit more general. This is my favorite one here. This is so I've learned that there's a difference between the common sea dragon, the weedy sea dragon, and the leafy sea dragon. Um, and here we're looking at a picture of a weedy sea dragon that was taken off the coast of um, Victoria, uh, over near, um, near over near Crow's Island, or not too far from Flinders. Um, and what it does, it'll tell you who has suggested, so who's seen the photo uploaded, what have they suggested that it could be, what species it could be, um, and then also looking, so the more people that identify it, then the better, the, the stronger it is for scientific purposes. Then it will show you where it was found, um, observations in the field from the person itself, and then down here it'll tell you about the quality assessment. What grade was it? In this case, it's research grade because of all of the accompanying information. So that allows people then to upload fauna, flora, wherever they are. But like I said, it's a bit more generic. If we look at wild me, wild me you'll see is very specific. So they actually only, at this point, they track 53 species. They've done 74 publications based on the data that they've generated. It's been 12 years in development, and they have seven, seven ID algorithms, which are all open source. For anyone who's interested, you can go and actually look at the algorithms. They're all published in GitHub. So if we look at the different platforms that they have for animals, they'll tell you how many sightings they've had of each. So we have everything from sharks to zebras to um, amphibians, et cetera. But what we're interested in is sea dragons. I don't know why sea dragons. That was just the thing that came up. So um, here it'll show you that the algorithm that's used for the sea dragon wild search um, wild me is the hotspotter, which is a SIFT based computer vision algorithm. So what it does is it analyzes the texture and the patterns um, for each animal and I, another almost like facial recognition, but for animals. Um, and then it compares that against all the other images in the database to see if it can make matches to see if you can start tracking individual animals. When you go to Sea Dragon Search, it'll show you where all the sightings, all the animals that they're tracking currently are. And then they also have a gallery. Now this one isn't as interactive unless you sign up and you can sign up, it's free to sign up. They don't charge you for it. Um, and then what they'll do is they'll show you all of the different animals that they're currently tracking. So these are all the animals that they're currently tracking off the coast of Australia. Um, if you look at, where was the one, this one. So I think it's just the, so what it will do is um, when you actually log in, it will give you all of the details of where this animal has been tracked, um, how far it's been traveling around its own home location um, and any interactions that it's had with any other sea dragons that it's tracking. Um, so what this does is it allows scientists to be able to, um, as I said, really take um, time to understand where these amazing creatures are. One of the things that makes sea dragons so incredible is that they're one of the few species on the planet where the males actually incubate their young um, as opposed to the females. And there's actually quite a lot of scientific reasons to study and understand sea dragons to help humans better understand our planet and better understand ourselves. And with that, I hope you all go and check out iNaturalist. Go take photos in the wild that help to conserve the nature around you. And with that, I will pass on to Viren. Thank you. Thank you, Melly. And if you learned something about sea tra dragons, please post in the uh, chat or if you have any questions. I've shared a couple of links uh, for follow up around Microsoft Sustainability Manager. If you're a customer, you can go sign up for a no cost trial. If you're a partner, I've got an article on LinkedIn talking about uh, the Microsoft Partner Network approach and how you can get your own sandbox environment. Viren, Microsoft Wonderful. Planetary Computer. Thanks what very is much, a guys. Computer? That's, that's such a good question. Thank you for that, uh, guys. That's really good. 
So uh, hi guys, I'm Viren, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, this concept of a planetary computer. Now, hopefully you can see my screen. On my screen, I've got this idea or this, this website that I'm going to use. I do a lot of AI conversations at the MTC. Uh, if you twist my arm, I'll talk to you about data. And um, if you've got a really interesting use case, I'll talk to you about quantum. But today I'm going to talk to you about something very close to my heart. This is the area of sustainability, but what you can actually do with this kind of thing uh, from a compute perspective. So if you take satellites, right, you've got lots of satellites. And if you take all the imagery that's coming from satellites, right, you've got to have a way of analyzing all of this information. So what we've done is underneath this AI for good program, we've actually created this place that you can do this analysis. So what we've got is three different things. One is a whole section of satellite information, but coming from different things, different satellites. Now, if I take, for example, you can see that this is a lot of different things. There's there's a very, very wide variety. So there's over 40 petabytes, and I'm talking about a number that's probably two years old now. But uh, if I look at this example, let's say Sentinel-2. Now, Sentinel-2 are two satellites that sort of hover at 180 degrees uh, in phase like this, and they try and cover the whole Earth, and uh, they take photographs of everything, uh, but it's at a different resolution, right? So it's between 10 and about 60 meter resolution, and uh, uh, depending on the band, and uh, it does this every five days, right? So where are you going to put all of this data? So uh, if I go in here, you can see that this is. Uh, uh, if I want to explore this information now, this is years and years of information. Now, how do you actually work with this? If I go, I can actually explore this. Now, what we've done, we've not just taken this data set, we've uh, stored it for you to use, which you can use. It's on a blob store, basically. But uh, we can we can also add some level of uh, interaction against this. So we've created an API, uh, a set of features as, as against which you can try and search for these different things. Now, if I just zoom out of this map over here, and uh, what I want to do is actually go and look in Australia. So if I'm looking for a particular area that I want to analyze, and today I want to look at the Great Barrier Reef because I'm sure that's on the bucket list for many people uh, to try and do, and preservation and conservation of that is a big and important task. So if we go into this, if I keep zooming in, what you will then very quickly see is imagery that comes up, right? So this is imagery that's the most recent um, over this particular area. And if you can see on your left hand side, if I move my mouse over these different tiles, these are the separate images that have been taken over a period of time, right? And um, this might be just the most recent from a large data set. And you can see it's all been stitched together. Now, down here is the reef. You can see the Great Barrier Reef following around like this. What I want to do is if I want to analyze this, then the first thing I need to do is take this and stack it up together. Um, and just for that one particular area, and what we can do is if you say explore the results in the hub, uh, we get this coordinates of a polygon, right? I can take these polygons and I can start to use this to reference the exact same thing that I'm looking on my screen right now. And it's got this option called open hub, which I've already done over here. Now in the hub, the hub is, a Jupiter environment which has a dask cluster connected to it. I've just started my dask cluster and you can see I've, what I've done is I've actually put my uh, polygons in the coordinates in there for that particular set of polygons here. And that's the reef. So what I want to do is I want it, uh, I want to go and look at that particular data set. And because we've taken years of information, we've created an API on top of it we're able to reference some of that data directly, right? So I'm able to go and actually say, give me some of that data, pull that out for me. And at this point, I'm actually looking at uh, everything that's going from 2020, the beginning of this year to uh, last month. And I can change this uh, to anything that I want. So let's just make this uh, more relevant, make it for a couple of days ago. And uh, it's going to pull out 68 different items just now, right? So it's found 68 of those images that we just looked at, uh, those different tiles, and I'm going to try and pull out a set of those tiles. Now, what I want to do is, uh, because we've got an API attached to it, you can do things like this, right? You can add a query level over here that says, look for any image in that list 
that has a cloud cover of less than 10%, right? So we're trying to figure out where is the best set of images over that period of time that I can potentially use. And it's come back, that's why it's come back to just 68 images in that uh, scenario there. So let's continue down this path here. And what I want to do is I want to get those images and I want to show you what each of those images actually has a lot of different information in it. So you've got in you've got like 24 different uh, metrics that you can actually get from each of those images. Now, you know, you've got red, blue, green, obviously at 10 meter resolution, you've got near infrared, you've got uh, at 20 meters, you've got shortwave infrared, uh, two different levels, and then you've got uh, water vapor, aerosol, a bunch of other things at 60 meters. So a lot of different information. Now, if I want to analyze this information, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm just going to put it through. Uh, I'm going to you know, grab that, have a quick look at one of those images. Here's one example of an image that we're looking at right now. So that's one of the slices, and I want that entire area right, of the brief. But what I want to do is I want to create a mosaic, which is, uh, which is a cloud-free mosaic of that entire area. Right? Now, that is a very important step to do because you can't really check for things if you've got clouds everywhere. I can't see it. So what we do is we stack that up together and then we take for every pixel, we take an average number over that period of time because clouds move. The chances of that cloud being in that same place over all those images is quite low, right? So uh, it will uh, it will average that out essentially and that. Takes compute to try and do. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull that out. Uh, I'm going to stack that together. And you will see. You'll see that I'm going to try and persist that data first, right? So because I'm using a Dask cluster over here, and this cluster is available as part of the compute, uh, uh, as part of the planetary compute, you can see that uh, it will actually pull up additional nodes if it needs to. You can see how the cluster is actually performing. You can see uh, where, uh, where the tasks are right now and a whole bunch of other metrics on the left hand side which can be uh, leveraged at the same time. So this might take a couple of minutes or maybe 30 seconds for it to get through here. Um, and as we do that, uh, we'll, uh, we can talk about the idea that there is a whole lot of other bits of information within this data catalog that you can also use to explore this, right? So right now we're only working with one piece over here. If you were exploring this catalog, and you can do it right now if you wanted by just going to planetarycomputer.com, uh, you can click on this global aspect over here and you can see that there's a lot of different uh, uh, pieces of information, a lot of different ways of analyzing a lot of different kinds of satellite information. Um, and uh, some of them have APIs, some of them don't have APIs. But uh, that's what uh, that's what we really got in this particular scenario. So if you don't have an API, you can access the blob directly and uh, and then you have to do a little bit more work around it to get to a certain data set that you want. Um, but if there is an API like we've got right now, then you can use that to explore that or you can use that to actually uh, create that. So I'm not going to wait for this cluster to finish because it's I think I've got one more minute, but as we get through this, here's something I prepared earlier, right? You can watch this happening as well. So now this is a composite image of all of that. This is the average of that particular reference point in the polygon. It's taken all the clouds out and you've got that as a starting one, beautiful starting point for you to work with. Uh, without needing to try and do this on your little laptop, right? Because it'll take you a long, long time to do that. You've taken large amounts of satellite data. You have figured out which bits you wanted. You've uh, averaged those out. You've created a composite image, and this would have, in a few years ago, would have taken uh, six or seven months of work to do with a lot of a lot of different people, and uh, would have cost a lot of money. But right now, we've just done it in like uh, 20 minutes, right? So this is something that we did do and uh, show one of the, the, the people at the Great Barrier Reef Authority as well, and uh, they thought it was really good. So I will stop at that because I'm now on time. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I hope that was uh, useful for you. Thank you, Varun. Thank you, Melly. Uh, quick little demo bite, 45 minutes, three different topics. Uh, please enjoy the rest of Ignite. Uh, I've shared all our LinkedIn details if these topics interest you and you'd like to reach out to us. Pretty big topic, um, 50 petabytes of data in planetary computer. But thank you, everyone. Uh, talk again soon. Bye.